Okay, everybody. So we are in chapter 26 still, uh, starting at slide 79. Now, I may not do um, videos of all almost, well, over 100 remaining slides in this chapter. I'm going to cover as many as I think you guys are going to need, and then you need to read the rest on your own. Not everything has to be lecture. Some of it's just pretty self-explanatory, okay? So we've been talking about the glomerular filtration rate. I'm just going to say GFR from now on because it's a lot easier. One of the ways we can regulate this rate is by using hormonal influence. So one of the things that will trigger hormonal influence of GFR is if you have an increased blood volume. So without the hormones, we automatically have an increase to GFR just as a reaction to promote fluid loss at the glomerular level. But we're going to use hormones to enhance this. So if the increase in blood volume is really big, well, then hormones are going to kick in to help us reduce, uh, excuse me, increase GFR to reduce the blood volume quickly, okay? So, some of the hormones that we're going to talk about are natriuretic peptides. Now, these often come from the heart. Now, if you think about it, that makes sense. If there's a great increase in the blood volume in the circulatory system, then the heart is going to feel the strain. So as the atria are filling up with deoxygenated blood, it's going to stretch the walls because there's so much deoxygenated blood being returned to the heart. So that is going to be due to an increase in blood volume or blood pressure. So the heart itself can secrete a hormone called atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP. Obviously, it's got atrial, so it's released by the atria of the heart. And what it'll do is this hormone will go back to the kidney, and it will dilate the afferent arterioles into the glomerulus. Remember, that's the incoming blood supply into the capsule. And it will constrict the efferent ones. That's the blood leaving the capsule. So what does that do? It puts more blood into the capsule at one time. It increases the pressure in the capsule, which drives more of the fluid into the intercapsular space and then into the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so this is a way to hold the blood in the glomerulus and increase the pressure so that more of the fluid, since we have too much fluid in the blood, is being pushed into the capsular space. It's going to then increase reabsorption. Okay, we also have postganglionic fibers that can control GFR with the autonomic system. So sympathetic activation, that's our, your fight or flight response. So if you are in a big... A frightening experience or your stress level is up, then you're going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. It's going to constrict the afferent glomerular arterioles. So that's going to reduce the amount of blood coming into the capsule. This is going to slow down the filtration rate and it's going to slow filtrate production. So it's going to reduce the amount of urine eventually produced. Sympathetic activation can override local regulatory mechanisms that would stabilize glomerular filtration rate. All right, at the renal corpuscle, we have filtration that is passive. So what does this mean? Well, we have several layers, some of that are leakier than others, and just the passive blood pressure is going to force the fluid through these filters. The solutes are going to be then sorted by size. The little ones are going to get all the way through, and the, the bigger ones are going to get trapped and get reabsorbed. So the solutes are going to be metabolic wastes and excess ions. Remember, ions are very tiny glucose, free fatty acids, amino acids, and vitamins. Now, you don't want to lose all these things. These are important things other than the metabolic waste. So what we're going to do is we're going to send it all out of the blood, but then we're going to take some time in the nephron and reabsorb all useful materials. We're going to reabsorb them in the renal tubules and the collecting system. So the three functions of the renal tubule are to reabsorb anything that's useful that gets forced out in the filtration process, to reabsorb more than 90% of the water, and then to use what's left to get rid of any waste that we really want to leave the body. So any waste that wasn't in the filtrate at the glomerulus, well, we might actually actively transport it into the urine so that it can be eliminated through urination. So the principles of reabsorption and secretion. Reabsorption is going to be taking up all useful materials that have escaped into the filtrate, and we're going to return them to the bloodstream. 99% of the filtrate is reabsorbed. 
So we're only really getting rid of 1% of all the things that go through the kidney. Now, that's reabsorption. That's taking things back into the blood. There are some things in the blood that we want to get rid of that is secretion. We want to take substances out of the blood and put them purposefully into the tubular fluid, which is going to become urine. And we're going to use these two processes together, reabsorption and secretion, and we're going to use it in every segment of the renal tubule and in the collecting system. So we're going to be adding things and taking things away from the filtrate all the way until it goes into the minor calyx of the kidney. So... In order to have these processes, we're going to see some old friends of ours, diffusion, osmosis, leak channels, and carrier-mediated transport. Let's just do a little review. There's different kinds of diffusion. There's just open diffusion. There's facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion just means we make a doorway for something to go through. Uh, simple diffusion means it can go through the membrane. Most things can't just go through membranes. There's active transport when we're working against diffusion working against the concentration gradient. There's co-transport where we're moving two things in the same direction. And there's counter-transport where we're moving two things in opposite directions. So carrier-mediated transport means we're going to use a particular protein that is designed to only carry one substrate. And it's going to help that substrate get across the lipid bilayer of a membrane. It usually only works in one direction. And where we put the protein carriers and the distribution, it will vary along the cell surface. So we may cluster them together in one particular area. This, the membrane of a single, single tubular cell contains many different types of carrier proteins. So if we take all of our carrier proteins and we fill them with substrate and we let them work continually, we're going to reach what is called the transport maximum for that substrate. So if that nutrient concentration rises in the tubular fluid, we will increase the rate of reabsorption until all of our carriers are filled. And that is when we reach T, T sub M or transport maximum. If you have more than your transport maximum, well then they cannot uh, possibly keep up and you will not be able to reabsorb all of that particular nutrient. Some material of that nutrient then will remain in the tubular fluid and would appear in the urine. The transport maximum also determines what's called your renal threshold. So what's your renal threshold? Well, that is how much of something can be in the plasma of your blood. And at what point does it begin to appear in urine? So it reaches its transport maximum. It continues to go into the urine and we can actually detect it in urine. And it's going to be different from substance to substance. Now, this is one of the diagnostic tests to look for type 2 diabetes because if your plasma glucose is higher than 180 milligrams per deciliter, then that has reached the renal threshold and we will begin to spill glucose into the urine, which is called glucosuria. <coughs> excuse me. And so that is a, an indication that your immune, or excuse me, your endocrine system is not handling blood glucose very well and you're not able to reabsorb it at a proper rate to bring it down to less than 180 milligrams per deciliter. So this is one of those diagnostic tests to see if you have type 2 diabetes. For amino acids, the threshold is even lower. It's only 65 milligrams per deciliter. So after a big protein meal, you will often dump amino acids into the urine, and that's called amino aciduria. Oops. Now we're going to talk about some osmotic concentration or the osmolarity. That's how many little particles of a solute are in a liter. And we will express that as osmoles per liter or milliosmoles per liter. And most of your body fluids hang out at an osmotic concentration of about 300 milliosmoles per liter. Ion concentrations are in milliequivalents per liter. And large organic molecules are reported as mass per unit volume, like milligrams per deciliter, as we saw for glucose. Okay, so here are some of the ideas of some of the things that are going to get reabsorbed. The ions that are reabsorbed and the metabolites. So things that get reabsorbed are sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfate, and I cannot for the life of me remember what HCO3 is right now. HCO. Whatever HCO3 is. Sorry, it's an early morning. All right, we're going to get rid of potassium. Notice we reabsorb and secrete potassium and a different form of calcium ion and phosphates. 
The metabolites that are reabsorbed are glucose, amino acids, proteins, and vitamins up to our transport maximum. Wastes that are secreted are creatinine, ammonia, metabolic acids, and bases. And we also can get rid of some old neurotransmitters, things like histamine if you're having an immune response, and particularly drugs. Your liver breaks them down and your kidneys get rid of them, like penicillin, atropine, morphine, and other drugs. Some parts that are gonna we're gonna see play a role here, but have no transport mechanisms are urea, water, urobilinogen, and bilirubin. And we will talk about those a little bit more later. Okay, so we're gonna begin the reabsorption and secretion process in the proximal convoluted tubule, the PCT. This is the first section after the capsular space. This is the first part of the nephron. They normally are. This region is normally primarily responsible for reabsorption. Less secretion, more reabsorption. And it reabsorbs 60 to 70% of the filtrate. So all the stuff we just pushed out of the blood in the very first section of the kidney tubule is going to be reabsorbed, 60 to 70% of it. So first, the fluids leave the tubes, the tube, the, the proximal convoluted tubule, and they go into the space outside the tubule but it's still not part of the blood. So that's called peritubular fluid. That means around the tube, okay? And then they go from the peritubular fluid into the peritubular capillaries. So you notice we're gonna to have to have three different regions of concentration. What's in the tubule, what's just outside the tubule, and what's in the capillaries. And remember in diffusion, things go down their gradient. So if we have a high concentration of it in the tubule and less in the peritubular fluid, it's gonna leave the tubule, go to the paratubular fluid. Then if that's higher than the blood, it will leave the paratubular fluid and enter the capillary. I hope that's making sense without you being able to see it. Okay, so the job of the proximal convoluted tubule. Primary job, reabsorption of organic nutrients. Active reabsorption of ions. Anytime you see active, I want you to think it's gonna burn ATP, it's gonna use a pump. Reabsorption of water, passive reabsorption of ions, and secretion. So, sodium ion reabsorption is very important in the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? So we're going to enter, have them enter the cells by diffusion, first of all through leaky channels. Now, leaky channels don't have gates, so they're open all the time. So the sodium is free to follow its concentration gradient and come and go. So it's only going to be reabsorbed if the concentration of sodium is less in the peritubular fluid than it is in the tubular fluid. Then we're gonna have sodium ion linked co-transport of organic solutes. So we're gonna use that sodium to kind of come back around and allow other things to be transported. And then we're also going to use it as a trade-in, a counter-transport for hydrogen ions. So here is the purple section here, shows you where the proximal convoluted tubule is. It's highlighted here, just outside the glomerulus. So as soon as the, the fluid comes into the peri, um, the intercapsular space, it's gonna go into the proximal convoluted tubule. And if we were to take a slice here, we would see cuboidal epithelial cells, and then the center is the lumen where the fluid is. Okay, now notice the key, we're gonna be using this key in a lot of our diagrams. So water is a blue arrow, and it's showing it's coming out of the tube and into the peritubular space, so that is being reabsorbed. Solutes are being reabsorbed. This is the solid orange arrow. And then we have a dotted edge orange arrow showing variable solute reabsorption or secretion based on transport. So here's an up close view. Now I'm not gonna test you on every single ion and which way it's going. I want you to understand the overall processes, okay? So I'm not gonna go over tremendous detail. But just kind of keep in mind, what's the overall goal here? We want to form urine. We want to preserve as much of the water and nutrients and things that our body can use and take them back out of the urine. And we want to put the things that our body truly wants to get rid of into the urine. And we want to concentrate the urine so that we're not peeing all the time. Does that make sense to everybody? So all these steps along the way are going to create what we know as urine, which ends up being an acidic fluid, which will be important because that means it's going to have hydrogen ions in it right? And it's going to contain urea. That's where we get the word urine from, which is a byproduct of breaking down amino acids. So those are two major parts of urine. Okay, so the next section is called the nephron loop, the descending and ascending loop. 
60 to 70% of the volume is reabsorbed before it ever gets to the loop because we saw it got reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. So the loop is then able to reabsorb about a half of what's left of the water, but two thirds of the sodium and chloride ions that are still in the filtrate. The descending limb lets water come and go, but does not let solutes move. So in the beginning, we're going to have sodium and chloride ions being absorbed. Okay, the descending thin limb reabsorbs sodium and chloride ions from the tubular fluid into the body. In the ascending limb, so after we get down to the bottom of the nephron and curve back up, well now we're not going to let the water move. Okay, so we are going to have gotten rid of some sodium and chloride from the tubular fluid. We are going to have water that's been able to come and go. We turn the corner. Now water cannot get out of the tubule. So now it's going to passively and actively remove sodium and chloride from the tubular fluid. Very, very long in those juxtamedullary neurons, creating high solute concentrations in the fluid outside the tubule. Only 15 to 20 percent of the filtrate volume ever gets to the last section of the nephron before the collecting duct, which is the distal convoluted tubule. And this is where we're going to be fine-tuning concentrations of electrolytes and metabolic rate wastes, and it no longer looks like the concentration of blood. This is now a unique body fluid because it's gone through the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop, the thin section, and the ascending loop. So now we have a completely different makeup of this fluid than what we started with. The three processes, processes that the distal convoluted tubule are responsible for are active secretion of ions, acids, drugs, and toxins. So now instead of just letting things diffuse, we're going to be putting stuff into the filtrate to get it out of the body. We're still going to try to reabsorb some sodium and calcium ions. And we're going to allow a little bit of reabsorption of water. And that's to fine tune the concentration of the tubular fluid. Reabsorption of the distal convoluted tubule. We are going to actively transport sodium and chloride out of tubular fluid into the peritubular fluid. And along the distal regions, we're going to have cells that pump sodium and reabsorb sodium. So take sodium out of the filtrate and put potassium into the filtrate, or some other cation, but it is usually potassium. So here we are, we're up at the very top of the tubule here, okay? And you can see our key has gotten a lot more complicated, but you can kind of see that at this point we have more things coming out still of the, peri of the tubular fluid into the peritubular fluid and into the capillary, then and the only thing we really have going in it looks like it's possibly potassium ions and wastes, okay? So let's talk about some other hormones that affect this. Aldosterone is a hormone that is made by the adrenal cortex. Remember, the cortex is the three layers that are around the outside of the adrenal gland. And aldosterone makes more sodium pumps and channels and puts them in plasma membranes along the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. So what does this do? More pumps are going to allow us to get more sodium out of the urine before it leaves the body. So this is going to reduce the amount of sodium lost in urine. So an increase in aldosterone increases sodium absorption by the body. Okay, and there's another nice diagram. Okay, some other conditions. Hypokalemia. This is when you actually get rid of too much potassium in your plasma, in your blood. And this is when you have aldosterone stimulation for too long a time. Remember, those sodium pumps will exchange sodium coming in for potassium going out. And so if you get rid of too much potassium, you can develop this condition. We also have influence by atrial natriuretic peptide. We already talked about that. Remember, that's the one that, in, that influences the glomerular filtration rate because of stretch in the atria. And so it wants to do the opposite of aldosterone because increasing sodium if you think about it, it will also increase the body's tendency to hold more water, which would increase blood volume. And ANP is working on getting rid of blood volume. So it is opposed to the actions of aldosterone. 
Parathyroid hormone is going to control calcium ion reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule. And you can go back to the endocrine tractor and see what parathyroid hormone does. Okay, how about secreting things at the distal convoluted tubule? Well, the blood that's going into the paratubular capillaries might have waste in it that the body needs to get rid of. It didn't cross the filtration membrane of glomerulus, but nonetheless, we want to get rid of it. And so we're going to actively secrete from the blood into the paratubular fluid and eventually into the filtrate, into the urine, in the distal convoluted tubule. The rate of potassium and hydrogen ion secretion rises or falls according to what's in the peritubular fluid. And so higher concentrations of those will lead to higher rates of secretion in the urine. Potassium ion secretion, we're going to, again, exchange sodium for potassium. So potassium ions diffuse into the distal convoluted tubule to join the urine through potassium leak channels. And these are at the very tips of tubular cells. Hydrogen ions are going to be generated anytime we dissociate carbonic acid. Now that's part of our blood pH buffer system. Carbo carbonic acid um, <clears throat> will fall apart and release hydrogen ions whenever we need to neutralize our pH a bit. They're also secreted by sodium ion linked countertransport in exchange for sodium in tubular fluid. So we're going to bring sodium out of the urine into the body and we're going to put hydrogen ions out of the blood and into the urine. Again, that makes the urine acidic. Bicarbonate ions diffuse into the blood stream to help prevent changes in plasma pH. Okay, so putting the hydrogen ions into the urine acidifies the tubular fluid elevates blood pH because those hydrogens are leaving the blood. So it takes the blood up closer to 14. Remember that's elevating, that's becoming more basic. And it will accelerate this if the blood pH begins to fall and become too acidic. The pH of blood will decrease or become acidic in metabolic acidosis, which is after you've exhausted your muscles and you've gone into lactic fermentation or in ketoacidosis, in starvation, or something called di diabetes mellitus. And there's another lovely diagram. So controlling blood pH, then, is accomplished by removing hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions at the kidneys. Aldosterone is going to secrete increased hydrogen ion secretion, and too much aldosterone can cause alkalosis, or you actually go too high in pH of the blood abnormally high blood pH. So if this acidosis response to low a pH, you're going to have in the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule, you're going to deaminate amino acids, which will tie up hydrogen ions and then raise the pH. It will give us, though, ammonium ions, NH4, and bicarbonate ions. Well, there's my HCO3. See, I was just having a brain fart earlier. That's bicarbonate. Ammonium ions are pumped into the tubular fluid. Bicarbonate ions will go into the bloodstream from the peritubular fluid. And the benefits of doing this in the tubes gives us carbon chains for catabolism and generates bicarbonate ions to buffer the plasma. Reabsorption and secretion in the last section, the collecting system. The collecting ducts are going to get tubular fluid from all the nephrons and carry it towards the renal sinus. The hormones are going to regulate the water and solute loss, and aldosterone controls sodium ion pumps, and ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, controls the permeability to water. Aldosterone is opposed by atrial natriuretic peptide, and antidiuretic hormone secretion is suppressed by atrial natriuretic peptide. So what are we going to reabsorb? We're going to reabsorb sodium and exchange it for potassium. We're going to reabsorb bicarbonate and exchange it for chloride ions. That's a new one. That's a new one, right? We haven't really talked much about chloride. And we're going to reabsorb some urea by diffusion. Secretion. We're going to help use secretion to control the pH of our body fluids. If we have a low pH in peritubular fluid, we're going to pump hydrogen ions into the tubular fluid and reabsorb bicarbonate ions to raise that pH. If we have a high pH in the peritubular fluid, remember this is outside of the nephron, 
this one is uncommon, then you will actually secrete bicarbonate ions to lower the pH of the peritubular fluid and bring hydrogen ions into the peritubular fluid. All right, now here we're going to hit some words that sound a whole lot like Charlie Brown's want, want, want teacher, okay? Don't hurt yourself over the terminology. Just kind of understand the concepts. Countercurrent multiplication. Countercurrent means going against the current, right? So we have two things going past each other. Countercurrent is an exchange between fluids moving in opposite directions. Multiplication means that we're going to, uh, the effect of the exchange increases the movement of fluid. So, between the two limbs of the loop, the descending limb and the ascending limb, remember the descending limb is really thin, the ascending limb is thick, the segments are really close together, so if you think about it, they basically, basically share the same peritubular fluid. Now remember, we're talking about diffusion here. So in diffusion, we're moving things due to their concentrations based on the filtrate in the tube, the peritubular fluid concentrations, and the blood capillary concentrations. So if these two limbs of this loop are in the same peritubular fluid, well, then that fluid is going to be really important to determine which direction things are moving. Okay, now one thing that makes them different is that the walls of the two different limbs, descending and ascending, have different permeabilities. So they're open to letting some things pass through and closed to other things passing through. And the two ascending and descending set tend to have the opposite, um, which ones are open and which ones are closed, as far as water absorption and ion being able to pass through. So going down the loop, it's permeable to water, so water can freely move into and out of the tubule, but is relatively impermeable to solutes. So anything that's a solute, like an ion or glucose or anything that's in the tube as it's going down the loop, can't get out, but water is going to be able to move freely. Now, think about it. If there's a lot of solute trapped in the tube, where's water going to go? It's going to go into the tube. So we're going to be pulling water out of the peritubular fluid and putting it into the descending thin limb. Okay? When you pull the water out of the peritubular fluid, now we're going to start to concentrate the solutes in the peritubular fluid. So as that fluid goes down the loop and turns the other way, it gets to the ascending limb. Now this one is relatively impermeable to water and to solutes, but it has active transport. So the active transport are going to pump sodium and chloride ions from the tubular fluid into the peritubular fluid of the medulla. So sodium and chloride ions are pumped out of the thick ascending limb. They're, it's going to raise the osmotic concentration of the peritubular fluid around the descending thin limb. And then that would then pull that water back out of the descending thin limb into the fluid, increasing the solute concentration of the fluid in the descending thin limb. The concentration, concentrated solution arrives in the thick ascending limb, and that is going to accelerate the transport, and we're going to solute pumping out of the thick ascending limb to increase solute concentration in tubular fluid and descending thin limb. So they're going to help each other with the direction we want the solutes and the water to go. Okay, medullary osmotic gradient. Concentration gradient that is created within the peritubular fluid. Active transport at the apical surface of the thick ascending limb moves sodium, potassium, and chloride out of the tubular fluid and uses a sodium chloride, sodium potassium to chloride transporter. That means every cycle we're just going to move one sodium, one potassium, and two chloride ions into the tubular cell from the fluid. Okay? Do not worry too much about medullary osmotic transport. I'm, again, not going to ask you about the nitty-gritty details of this, but this is kind of an overall view showing you where everything is moving. Okay, and here's an even more detailed view showing where water is leaving, where the sodium and chloride ions are being pumped, and what's happening with the peritubular fluid. Again, think big ideas here, guys. You don't memorize like 600 to 900 to 1,200. Don't do that to yourself. Just kind of understand overall picture.
okay? Um, this video is already longer than I'd like it to be, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. And I think you guys can get the idea and handle the rest of the chapter. Just go over the over the slides. Um, I'm not going to do another video, but I think you've got it now. Anyway, again, think big picture ideas. What is this doing for the urine? All right. I'll see you soon.